As we uh, consider the book of Leviticus this morning and thinking about the worship that was going on in the Old Testament, uh, what does that make us think about with our worship and the things that we do as we gather together? Um, Certainly, we would say that over the last few months, uh, our worship assemblies have uh, been altered in many different ways. Uh, and, and hopefully that's kind of sprung up a, a thought process about what it means to worship God and what, what worship is really all about. Uh, as we gather together and we, we lift one another up, we try to encourage one another, as we, uh, we consider what God has done for us and we study his word together, as we pray together, uh, you know, what kind of things are going through our minds uh, and, and how are we worshiping God? When we looked at Leviticus this morning, we saw uh, that God's people were gathering near to him and offering up sacrifices to him, and they were worshiping him with priests, and, and, and they were worshiping him with animal sacrifices and all of these different kinds of things. And, and as we went to the New Testament in Hebrews 10, we saw that things have changed dramatically for Christians in the New Testament, as they come into a new era of worship to God, uh, they had to, to retrain themselves, rethink about worship and what is worship uh, in order to get the right mindset and the right perspective. And you think about uh, all the different things that they used to do before Jesus versus all the things that they were doing after Jesus and the way they were thinking about worship after Jesus. And, and then we start to understand what worship is all about. The Hebrew writer really helps us understand this a little bit more. Uh, Somebody told me um, Leviticus really helps us understand the whole book of Hebrews, and I didn't realize that until I studied Leviticus, and now I'm just like, wow, you know, Hebrews just started racing through my mind. All these different things that are talked about in Hebrews and thinking about our worship. What I want us to do is uh, we're going to study chapters 10 and 11 of Hebrews tonight. Uh, and just from a big, bigger picture overview, not going to dive really deep into a lot of details. And then chapters 12 and 13 next week and help us understand what God wants from us in our worship uh, and, and thinking about what our worship really is. I remember a time when I was uh, younger and I would think about worship as being just a collection of activities that we would go through and we, we assemble together in order to worship God. That, uh, that, is what, that is what worship is. We assemble together, we, do, we pray, we sing, we partake of the Lord's Supper, we listen to sermons, uh, and, and, and we're, we're doing all these things to satisfy God because God wants us to worship Him. God wants us to exalt Him. But hopefully Leviticus has taught us that worship is about drawing near to God. And it's about honoring him through through giving him our sacrifices, giving him the things that that we hold dearest to us, as those those Israelites were doing. They were offering God the very best of what they had in order to have that close relationship with God. Uh, And and worship included a priesthood, sacrifices, it included sacrifices, it included a priesthood. Well, what about us? What's our sacrifice? And where are our priests? As we come to the New Testament, we see, as we said this morning, Jesus is our sacrifice. He is every sacrifice made on our behalf. We come and we don't have to bring an animal uh, to worship God. We don't have to bring the most valuable possession that we own and, and slaughter it to show God we trust him and to show God we love him. God has already provided for us the ultimate sacrifice that's pure and holy and able to make us clean. Uh, and And... Jesus not only is our sacrifice, but he's also our priest, the intermediary that allows for us to have an access to God, allows for us to draw near to God. And we saw this in Hebrews 10, 19. Let's read that again, verses 19 through uh, 22. It says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in the full assurance of faith. Think about these words that are being said here. We have a new and and living way to draw near to God 
through Jesus. Jesus is our sacrifice. He is also our priest. And so now we start thinking, okay, so Jesus is a sacrifice. Jesus is the priest. What are we doing when we come together to worship? How, how are we coming to worship God if, if all of that has been taken care of? If, if the priest is already in heaven making intercession for us, he's already offered the sacrifice, what are we supposed to bring? Listen to the details uh, that, that follow in verse 22 and following. He says this, listen to what we're supposed to bring to God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Notice what we're supposed to bring to God as we come to him in worship. What does God want from us? He says, I want a true heart. I want you to come to me with a true heart, with hearts that are sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Uh, and he says, with bodies that are washed with pure water and, and with a, a mouth that is confessing the hope that is within us without wavering, and also with a consideration of those around you. Notice how all of these things are pointing to internal things. What God wants from us is not that we bring him our money. <laughs> That's not the sacrifice God wants from us. What he wants from us is for us to bring him our heart, our body, our mind, our everything, our soul, everything about us. He wants us to just bring it, offering it to him, laying it down as a sacrifice at his feet, having a holy heart, a holy body, a holy mind, a, a, a heart, a body, a mind that is devoted to the observance of God's commands and the will of God in every facet. This is what God wants. This is what we do for God. This is how we serve him. This is how we worship him. It's not just the activities of gathering together three times a week or six times a week or as many times a week as we can. It is the heart that is holy, the body that is holy, and the mind that is holy, that is considering those around us and showing the love and, and, and encouraging and stirring up all of those who are also faithful. This is what we do for God. This is the way we sacrifice. Paul said in Romans 12 that we should consider our bodies to be living sacrifices. And that is our acceptable service, our acceptable worship to God, to, to give our bodies to God. Well, how do we do that? How do we develop a heart, a mind, a body that is seeking to do the will of God and that's showing itself to be holy and pure and righteous before God? How do we present God our very best whenever we approach his throne in worship? Notice some other things in this text. He says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. And then he says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Notice those three words that, that seem to be very prominent in our faith, our, our, relig our uh, belief system. Faith, hope, and love. That these three things are what is developing holiness inside of us. As we grow and develop faith, we are becoming more holy for God, more submissive to God's will. We're growing to be more obedient. As we're, as we're developing our hope, our understanding of what is before us, our focus on the things that are before us, we are becoming more holy. And as we develop our love for other people, we are becoming holy more and more holy and righteous before God, more pleasing to God. We're giving God what he wants in our worship of him. You continue a little ways. You, you see in verse 32 
that these Hebrews that have been receiving, that have received this letter, all once had faith, hope, and love. But they're starting to slip a little bit. Read with me verses 32 through 36. He says, But recall the former days when you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Listen to the way this is described. As, as, as he says, at one time, in the former days, you endured strugglings. You endured sufferings. You were uh, reproached. You were uh, afflicted. You had your property plundered. But you were, you were faithful. That, that's the picture of faith. All that suffering, all that struggling that you went through did not cause you to waver. You were unmovable. You had a faith that endured suffering. And then he says that you had uh, compassion on those who were in prison. You were thinking about others. Uh, you were considering those around you. You were loving toward those who were suffering around you and willing to suffer with them. That's love. And then he says, you accepted the plundering of your property because you knew that you had a better possession and an abiding one. What do we have here? We have faith. We have love. We have hope being seen in the recipients of this letter. They had all three. And he's pointing to this previous state as saying, this is who God wants you to be. This is what makes you pleasing to God. This is how we do the will of God. And he says, what we need now is endurance. We need the ability to continue to have faith, hope, and love in the days that are ahead of us. I think I've gotten way behind on all this. Let me catch up. So, so all three of these things are seen here, but they're now struggling to maintain these things. I want to just pause for a second and think about this. Can we relate to our need for endurance in these three areas? <laughs> to endure in, in faith whenever things get tough? To, to continue to focus on the hope that is set before us? To have enough love to suffer alongside someone else? Do we not need endurance? How many of us can look back at the beginning of our Christian walk and see that we thought it would be a sprint? <laughs> we were going full bore at the very beginning, had no clue how tough it would become and how out of gas we would get uh, as we were striving so hard for the finish line. And then things happen and and our faith begins to waver. We, we lose sight of the hope. We don't have the love that we ought to have. We're not able to endure that level of faithfulness. We're starting to struggle. And this is exactly what this writer is saying his recipients have done. They're struggling to endure with their faith, their love, and their hope intact. And so we need to be lifted up. We need to be refocused in on these three attributes so that we can be holy and pleasing to God as we offer our worship to God. Worshiping God is not about doing all these right activities in all these right ways as much as it's about having the real faith, hope, and love that God is desiring for us to have. All of those external activities should be the outpouring of the internal heart the body, the soul that loves God and wants to submit to the will of God with everything that we have. So how do we develop our faith? How do we develop our hope? How do we develop our love? I'm glad you asked. Uh, because that's what he's going to tell us about in the remaining sections of this book. If you were to divide up the rest of Hebrews, you would see uh, that chapter 10, verse 37, all the way through chapter 12, verse 4, is about faith. And that's what we're going to study tonight. And then chapter, 11, uh, chapter 12, verse 5, 
all the way through the end of the chapter of chapter 12 is about hope. And chapter 13, majority of it's about love. We're going to talk about faith tonight uh, and the introduction to this. And then we're going to talk about hope and love next time. So, so we need to develop all three of these things. And the Hebrew writer is helping us develop these three things. First of all, he talks about faith. So, so we're going to really zone in on faith tonight and understanding what faith is and, and how we develop our faith. As you read, the, the Hebrew writer continues in verse 37. He says, For yet a little while, uh, and, and, a, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Notice how he starts off here talking about faith as being the thing that gives spiritual life. Spiritual life is essentially the ability to approach God's throne, the ability to be made pure, holy, clean, forgiven. And so he says here, he quotes Habakkuk to say, uh, the righteous ones will live by faith. We are made righteous by faith, not because we are pure and, and able to abstain from all sin and, and living a perfect life, but because God looks at our faith and he says, because we have faith, that we are righteous. So he says here, the righteous will live by faith. And then he describes faith. And he describes it in three different ways. And we're going to look at all three of these. First of all, notice at the end of that he says, If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And he says, verse 39, But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. A lot of times in defining faith, I would typically run to Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped, uh, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, right? That's a definition of faith, right? Look at 1039. This is the beginning of the definition. I, I can't stand chapter divisions. Sometimes I really wish uh, we just didn't have those or that, that they would have done them all the way that I wish they were, but uh, they, it is what it is. Uh, and, and what you see at the end of chapter 10, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed is the beginning of the description of faith. That having faith means you don't shrink back when suffering is inevitable. You don't shrink back. You don't, you don't question the goodness of God, the righteousness of God. You don't think, well, maybe this was all a big mistake. Uh, maybe I would be better off doing what I really want to do rather than what God wants me to do. Faith does not get uh, distracted or pulled away and, and thinking, oh, it's too hard. It's not worth it. Faith doesn't shrink back. Instead, faith has a full assurance, he says, of things that are hoped for, and a conviction, he says, of things not seen. Now think about these statements. The assurance of things hoped for. This is talking about God's future faithfulness. The assurance, the, the full belief and the acceptance and, and the, the even conviction that God will provide the things that he has promised. I am assured of God's faithfulness, of all of his promises. He will give me everything that I'm hoping for him to give me that he has promised me. And the conviction of things not seen is referring to all the previous acts of God. All of his faithfulness that has happened throughout all of history. He even points to the creation by the word of God. Something that's unseen and saying, I'm, con I'm convicted that our God is good and faithful and able to save to the uttermost mankind. It's this conviction that God is good, God is faithful. And as we continue, we see a number of examples uh, to help us better understand the assurance of the faithfulness of God in the future and the conviction of God's faithfulness in the past. And all of these examples that we read about in chapter 11 are examples of men and women who did not shrink back when the suffering came, when the struggles came. When the trials and the temptation and the turmoil came into their life, they remained faithful to God. Now, did they make a mistake? Yeah. But they remained faithful to God. They never let go of God. 
Their faith was unshrinkable. <laughs> Their faith was unshrinkable. In all these examples, notice how he starts off. Verse 4. He says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Notice the first person that he uses as an example is Abel, who makes a sacrifice in worship to God. You see how he's going back to chapter 10 and thinking about our worship to God is not so much focused on the sacrifice, but on the faith. The faith is what God saw, and that's what God loved, and that's what God was pleased with. Abel had faith that the life of the animal would, would be enough for God, that God would make up what is lacking in the life of an animal for his own life. He sinned, he's worthy of death, and he said, God, please take the life of the animal rather than me. He had great faith, and because of that, he was commended as righteous. And through his faith, listen to this, though he died, he still speaks. The righteous live. The righteous live. They have eternal life. They don't die. The next example is a man by the name of Enoch. Now, these things are pretty fresh on our mind. We just studied Genesis, right? You remember Enoch. Uh, Enoch just shows up out of nowhere, and it says he walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And we're just like, wait, what, is, what, whoa, 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 what happened there? How did Enoch walk with God, and how was he able to be with God? What did he do that made him so different? And it's like a little glimmer of hope in Genesis without any explanation. Listen to the explanation, verse 5. By faith... Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Listen to that. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You see, they must have a conviction of God's, of God's history, his faithfulness, and an assurance of the rewards that he gives. But notice the words there, whoever would draw near to God. What are we talking about when we're talking about worshiping God? We're talking about drawing near to God. And what did Enoch do? He was taken to be with God. He was able to be brought into God's presence. Was it because he's so righteous and so perfect and did everything right where no man before him did? Well, this writer says it was because of his faith. His faith is what God counted as righteousness. His, his convictions, his, his unwillingness to shrink back when pressured to do what's wrong, and when pressured to uh, disobey and rebel against God, he was always willing to show faith and trust in God's goodness, in God's faithfulness. And so he endured the suffering of this life with faith. Then we have examples of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, all these uh, men and women, and you go to Moses, and, and it just continues. We even have Noah in here. All of these men and women who show tremendous faith in, in perilous times, in times when it doesn't seem like anything good's going to come out of it, they put their faith, their trust in God, rather than in themselves and rather than in the world around them and what the world around them is telling them. And because they're willing to keep the faith throughout it all, God said he is pleased with them and that he is preparing a city for them. You see the picture. It's repeated throughout this. God wants to be with us. God wants to be near us. He prepared a place for those who have faith in him and put their trust in him. As we go through all these examples, we see over and over again great faith and faithfulness and trust in God, uh, unwillingness to shrink back, even though many of them were put to death. They were unwilling to shrink back. They were always putting their faith, their, their trust 
in God over and over again. And they were finding that God is pleased with them that God finds their sacrifices acceptable, that because they didn't just bring him an ox or a lamb or a goat, they brought their lives to God, that God accepted them and wanted to draw near to them and bring them into his home. When we get to chapter 12, uh, listen to this. We see an encouragement, uh, an encouragement to have faith. He says, therefore... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. See how he brings all of this together. The picture of endurance, the picture of pressing on and and enduring through the race is brought into this. And, And notice how he talks about running a race. Imagine running a race with weights on. You're trying to run a race uh, for a track and field or whatever, and you're just loading yourself down with the heaviest garments, with lead weights. You're carrying dumbbells as you run to try to win the race. You're just loading yourself up. Who would do that, right? (laughs) Who would dress themselves like that? Now imagine also you you wear a trench coat, and you're just you're you're throwing on tons of layers of of clothes, and and you've got maybe. Uh, ladies, a skirt, you know, that's kind of tight, things tying you up. Uh, you've got all kinds of things that are keeping you from being able to run. And here the writer says, get rid of all that stuff. Run your race without all of that stuff. Because that's what God is pleased with. That's what faith does. It lays aside the weights. It lays aside the things that hinder us from being faithful, from being obedient, from from, uh, being strong in the midst of trials. It doesn't get bogged down by the affairs of this world. It presses on. So think for a minute about what's keeping us from running at our best. What is it that, that is literally hurting our ability to please God and to have a strong faith for God? What is it that, that we're clinging to or that's clinging to us? What is it that's weighing us down? What's making us less confident in God's faithfulness? What's making us question uh, his, uh, his love for us, his willingness to give us everything that he has promised us? Do we think that the forgiven sins that he said are forgiven are still on us? Are we dwelling on those things too much? That's keeping us from running at full speed. Is there something that maybe is pulling us away from God? Something that's distracting us and and making it to where we don't focus on God like we should? What is it that's going on in our lives that's keeping us from having the faith that's similar to these men and women of faith in the Old Testament. What are we pursuing that's not God? What are we pursuing that's not God's reward? What are we willing to give up those things for? All of these descriptions throughout all of this of a faith that pleases God is is given a climax here as, as he says, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Think for a second about all the pressures that Jesus went went through in his life. All of those who were telling him, you don't need to go to Jerusalem. You don't need to do this. Uh, you, don't, you don't need to talk to them like that. What are you doing? Uh, look, all the disciples are leaving you, Jesus. Why are you saying those things? All the things that, hindered, that, that attempted to hinder Jesus from doing his mission and doing the work that he was sent here to do. He just shrugged them off 
and pursued the joy that was set before him. He pursued righteousness. He pursued love and faith and hope. He pursued everything that God wanted him to pursue. He fully submitted his life to God. Why? For us. He did this all for us. Consider him, he says, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Do we have faith? Do we really have faith? As we approach the throne of God, are we full of, of faith in him? Are we unwavering? Are we unwilling to shrink back? As things go difficult in our lives, do we demonstrate that faith? It shines the brightest during the difficult times. When things are happy, we can kind of hide the fact that we don't have a real faith. But when things get hard, then we know for sure the quality of our faith. So what kind of faith do we have when we're tested? Do we have a faith that's unwavering, or do we have a faith that looks for the first opportunity to get out? We have plenty of examples of men and women who did not seek a way out, even when life gets hard. You know, they had all kinds of pressures in, in their families. Uh, they had pressures probably at their workplaces. They had pressures uh, at uh, their societies and their communities to, to live and to act in a certain way that meets up with the standards of the society around them that was unfaithful to God. And they refused to submit to the world. They did not shrink back. They did not give up. This is what Jesus wants from us. He did all of this suffering so that we would not grow weary or faint-hearted. In our struggle against sin, we would not shrink back and think, well, it's okay, I can just do this or that. You remember back in chapter 10, verse 38, the writer says, if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. We can't shrink back now. Whatever it is that, that stands between us and doing what God wants us to do, we have to move it out of the way. Lay aside whatever it is and pursue God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because having that full assurance of faith is pleasing to God. Having that confidence, that conviction of God's faithfulness is pleasing to God. And lacking faith is dangerous. God doesn't want those who don't have faith in him, don't, don't trust him, don't have confidence in him. He doesn't want them to approach his throne. That's not, that's not the type of person that he counts as righteous. And so as we look at ourselves, as I look at myself, and I consider the faith that I've had, the, the, the trust that I've had, as I go through different trials, as I go do, through different things in life, as I see myself waver, as I see myself start to slip in some way, I have to take those things very seriously and understand God's helping me see that my faith's not where it needs to be. We need to grow in faith and develop our faith to become pleasing to God and to show him that we love him more than we love even our own lives. Because we're ultimately not here for this earth and this life. We're here for the life he's promised to us. Where we get to live with him for all eternity. God has shown us great grace and love in providing the sacrifice and the priest that we need. To draw near to him, to live with him for all eternity. And if anybody here is not taking advantage of that sacrifice, we offer an opportunity for you to do that. And we want to give you that opportunity.